speaker is uh, Yashin Huang from Northwestern University, and he will talk about some materials innovations for a pandemic. Uh, Yashin, you can okay. share your screen. All right. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, you can put it in presentation mode. Yeah. Okay, perfect. cool. All right. Yeah, first, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers. This is a great opportunity, and it's uh, such an honor to uh, discuss an uh, important issue of the society, especially uh, hearing uh, Peter Tsai's work, uh, historical accounts. Uh, you are our hero. So a lot of my students will love to see you and meet with you one day. Anyway, so uh, let me start by uh, also making a disclaimer here. Um, so I have been working with carbon materials for a little while, um, but in this talk, I actually do not have any direct work about carbon materials, but I will share some thoughts about how they might be able to use for. Okay, so uh, just to justify that why I am here for carbon, uh, my group, uh, the key research philosophy in my group is to use chemistry tools and principles. We like to make materials more processable, uh, in, in particular carbon materials like graphene and nanotubes. So we like to make um, we like to make these materials more usable for others so that people can go on and discover wonderful properties and application. So for graphene oxide, we started out as a uh, uh, like entirely uh, curiosity driven uh, intellectual endeavor. So we started by looking at graphene oxide as 2D soft materials. And in, in particular, we worked quite a bit on their 2D surfactant properties. And through the study, we observed that many others were later on taking advantage of this to be used and to compete with molecular surfactants in bacterial membranes, and now we see in virus uh, membranes, uh, in virus envelopes as well. Yeah, Shin, can you so speak up a little bit really more? Okay. Can you speak oh, okay. up? Let me, sure, sure. Let me see if I get the right. How about now? It's now okay? Uh yeah, yeah, that's better, yeah. All right, it's better, okay, all right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, so, well, this part is entirely fun-driven. We're just using graphene oxide to uh, pursue a curiosity. And then after a while, we started to realize that we ought to do something for the carbon community. So we started to look into problems in materials processing, and we paid attention to rapid imaging and the aggregation resistance in dispersion state and solid state as represented by this image of crumpled graphene balls. We also look into the uh, flammability and the effect of salt impurity in the scale of manufacturing. So in recent years, we have been uh, more and more uh, directing our interest to use graphene oxide as a model system to explore materials agnostic 2D properties. And some examples include two-dimensional nanofluidics and colloidal dose without any um, additives, just uh, based on colloidal interactions themselves, you can turn super high concentration colloids into a multiple dose state. And in the end, you could actually turn into a high density disordered solid. As one example is, uh, we call this a bulk graphene glass where the graphene sheets are disorderly but tightly packed together. Okay, now, um, in, in terms of carbon nanotubes, we've been having fun uh, developing additive-free solution processing techniques that can disperse pristine carbon nanotubes in high throughput. This is a, one of the most recent examples that we can disperse single nanotube powders in a solvent cocktail, and then you can actually uh, adjust the composition of the solvent cocktail and make them suitable for rapid air brushing to make is coat various textile surfaces, et cetera. So I understand that there have been a lot of effort now using this kind of surfaces uh, as a uh, sanitizing textiles in COVID-19. So the idea is that you can photothermally heat up this layer or electrically um, heat up this layer. Um, uh, for various reasons, we haven't really done that, but uh, I think this process and technique is useful for that area. Now. A few years ago, uh, this is two years ago, we published a paper. This is now uh, started out as a very silly paper. A lot of people were actually laughing at us. Uh, we basically tried to show that graphene is actually a really wonderful hair dye material. Okay, uh, I can go on for an entire lecture to tell you why. <laughs> uh, in con quick conclusion is that this is actually a material solution to an extremely difficult chemical problem. 
and there are a lot of new possibilities and new functions as well. Okay, but the key take here is that this piece of work, I think more or less um, transformed or at least updated my uh, research philosophy, which is that when we think about, let's say, uh, applications of materials, when you try to solve a problem, address a problem in a society, we really need to take a user-centered philosophy rather than inventor-centered approach. So you have to really take a deep dive and talk to the users and to find out what are the problems and what are the real, uh, really relevant of the problems to you. So I, I put this slide here not to introduce the hair dye work, but just sort of to show the transition of how we start to think about this problem. So as many of you that we were um, very shocked uh, at the end of uh, January that uh, when we first learned about the uh, outbreak in Wuhan in China, somewhere here, and also uh, we were especially shocked by the uh, decision uh, of the Chinese government to shut down entire Wuhan city. My group have had quite a few students um, from Wuhan and some of them at that time were, were actually in Wuhan. Uh, fortunately, we're all okay and they, their families were also okay, but we, it just puzzled us like why, you know, why they decided to do such a drastic measure how bad is this? And then, you know, after a day or two, I just realized that, you know, I was completely powerless in this because I, I don't know what question to ask and I don't know what to comment. And at that time, there is just tons of misinformation flying around and it, it, it saddens me to see sometimes my professor colleagues are also clueless and pretty much just spreading all these <laughs> mis or disinformation. So, about like a week and one day I just realized that, you know, if I really want to, you know, have opinion about this, maybe let's just get to the bottom of this. Let's try to do some study. So I was very fortunate that uh, I start to study this for a week or two. I started by picking up a textbook. Uh, I will show you which one it is just to let's just read the textbooks and self-educate about the fundamental aspect of the viruses and uh, infectious diseases. And then I was very fortunate to have a graduate student who was as silly as I was, <laughs> or as brave. Uh, she's very brave, and so she joined me to do this. And together we ended up uh, developing quite a number of hypotheses, and we found a few problems that really uh, worth our attention, and a few also uh, common uh, common mistakes in in the uh, in the physical pictures of say the viruses and, and infectious diseases. So that's something I hope to share with you today. And also I will share you uh, what we do in, uh, we propose about probably a dozen of ideas. I will show you one of them uh, that we actually uh, are doing right now. So uh, just to a, before I run out of time, uh, we put all those ideas in this perspectives. Uh, this is the student I was talking about. And we actually started to, so mentally I was starting to plan in it, right, um, our Wuhan lockdown. I was just thinking about, I just had the urge about maybe we should do something, but I had no idea what exactly I could do because I have never learned this thing before. I, I actually didn't even know uh, intelligently what a virus is actually, um, actually is. But through a very intense self-study, uh, Hai Yue Huang and I were able to draft up the manuscript, the first version of these. And then we sent it over to, at that time, we sent it over to a number of biomedical researchers and also frontline clinicians uh, working in the uh, diagnosis, environmental detection, uh, patient care, and then uh, um, and also ICU care uh, uh, clinicians. Many of them had this experience in Wuhan as well as in other areas of China. So together they were uh, very, um, I was very moved by them because they all were very um, motivated to do this and they were all very selfish uh, this. And they, were, uh, they were open to share their ideas, their insights out of their extremely busy schedule, okay? So one of the ideas that um, is something I'm gonna talk about today so well, this is first about, first of all, this is what we learned. Uh, after we learned that, we just realized that, you know what, viruses are not scary at all, okay? They are really passive. Unlike bacteria and all other, you know, more active path pathogens, viruses are pretty much a cautious particles. It, well, it, they are really, really sophisticated, uh, sophisticated ones, but they are just cautious nanoparticles and they are 
to they are totally at the mercy of the environment. They cannot employ, they cannot attack, they cannot migrate, and they cannot self-duplicate outside, outside their host. And they don't spread by themselves. It is really us that are spreading them. So at that moment on, I, I felt already empowered that I just realized that viruses are not scary at all. What's scary is really us. We are the ones that really messed up, okay? All right. Now, from a material science point of view, uh, we talk a lot about structural property relationships, structured property, and then leading to performance. From this angle, so I'm not going to go into any details about the structures, and by the way, I'm not even expert in this, but let's just say if we look at a very high level intuitive picture, what do virus particles do? And why do they need to have all these sophisticated structure? Well, they need to fulfill just basically a single purpose. Uh, a virus particle need to be able to protect the genomic information which is stored in the genomic polymer inside and it, it needs to deliver this genomic information effectively to the host. That's the single uh, purpose to protect and to deliver. Now to achieve that function, they typically tend to evolve into a core shelf structure. The core is usually the genomic polymer in some form and the shell, shell is pretty much a very sophisticated packaging for protection and recognition. So for corona, uh, by the way, uh, this is an extremely sophisticated nanoparticle, okay, core shell nanoparticle, but they need to be, the whole structure, okay, with such high level of complexity, they need to stay intact throughout the entire process to avoid malfunction, meaning to avoid inactivation. So if anything happened to this virus particle, if any part of this is broken, it will be deactivated. So once you realize that, you'll be like, no, there should be a lot of ways that we can do, you know, to, to actually try to uh, inactivate this thing. Now, for, for uh, COVID-19 or other uh, related corona coronaviruses, they also have a, they belong to so-called uh, envelope uh, viruses family. And the envelope here, which is the purple line right here, which is pretty much a surfactant bilayer. And for those of you taking physical chemistry classes or teaching soft materials classes, this is a pretty um, classic object. And so again, you know, this empowers you to think that, you know, why is it so hard to just break that, right? And my personal guess is that it is really a problem of effective delivery of all these treatment actually to the virus particles themselves. Okay, so that's the basics of the structures. And then the next thing I, we, we wanted to understand, again, at a very high level intuitively, is that how do they spread? So it turns out that for all infectious diseases, well, in order for transmission and spread to occur, there are three necessary steps. So first, of course, you have to have some kind of source. And second, uh, the pathogens need to have certain transmission pathways or intermediates. They need to find some way to hop from one source, one host to the other. And third, you also need to have susceptible group of people. So if you if they reach a target, but the target for some reason it is not able to be, or is not easily infected, then this process also fail. So you really need to have all the three steps worked out for the virus particles in this case. And the virus particles, again, they need to in, remain intact in their structure in order for this whole thing to work. So, all right, uh, what are the, uh, okay, so this is the source. That's why, by the way, um, uh, as Peter nicely put it, that uh, putting face covering here intuitively, as you just look at this photo uh, picture, is gonna be the most effective way, okay? Um, all right, now what happens after these viruses uh, leave a person? So uh, for infectious respiratory diseases, the uh, uh, main transmission media is through these droplets, large or small, and also the uh, uh, corresponding uh, semi-dried particles later on. Now, uh, we all heard about social distancing and a droplet, uh, avoid the droplets. Those, are, uh, those typically occur through somewhat direct inhalation process, either when the person is really nearby, in that case, the large droplets works well, or when the person is far away, in that case, it's more of the uh, small particles that are still yet active. Now, it can also happen through so-called a contact and formity transmissions, which uh, basically can be described by uh, us uh, 
uh, accidentally or maybe we, we, we just carelessly uh, pick up viruses uh, deposited on something, either on another person, okay, or we picked it up from some virus contaminated objects. And then we transfer that to our hand and eventually transfer it to our respiratory tracts. Now, if you look at this one, you, you now you understand that the importance of hand washing. Now, here's the thing. If you have lots of virus on your hand, it's not going to infect you unless you have an opening in your skin, you have a wound, because your skin barrier actually stops all those. But the problem is that we always, we always help the virus particles, help them to transfer from our fingertips to our mouth, nose, nose and eyes. And how is that? Well, uh, right now, uh, for example, here's a study from uh, Australia, actually in a medical school. And it was very fun that they found out that, you know, they had a 26 medical student. These are medical students. They should know better already. But still, uh, when they observed, uh, when they did not know they were observed, they will actually uh, touch their faces about 23 times per hour. So today uh, I have to turn on my camera so I know I'm being watched. So I'm trying very hard to not touch my face. I'm resting my hands on the table, so I will not do that. But just to show you how badly uh, we, how you know, how badly we touch our faces. Uh, this is a few months ago. Uh, this is a clip from Trevor Noah's show, and I think this is really best illustrates why we are really helping out the virus. First, keep your hands clean. Today, start working on not touching your face because viruses spread is when you touch your own mouth, nose, or eyes. I've been looking around the room here. I can't tell you the number of you who've put your hands to your face in the last uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. Washing your hands and not taking, touching your mouth and your, your nose and your eyes. The common sense of washing your hands, not touching your face. Traditional rules of public health apply here. Just be smart. All right, so I found it hilarious this one, but it also highlights that, you know, again, you know, we are really the problem. Right? If everybody is super disciplined, I think we will be, we'll have a much less chance to uh, be infected. But on the other hand, it's not fair to, you know, require all human beings to suddenly change the behavior drastically. So, but what we can do is to come up with mitigation measures. So again, going back to this photo. So again, as uh, uh, Professor Chai nicely put it that, well, if you think about wearing masks, all right, so we can certainly have everybody wearing masks trying to protect yourself. But if you look at this diagram, the obvious problem now is that first you need to identify the source. This is why, again, testing is extremely important. And after you identify the source, or if you even don't even know what the source might be as a preventive measure, if everybody wears a mask, then you cut out the source. You have much higher likelihood to cut out the source. And this works to uh, the basic principles of mitigating uh, infectious diseases, cut down the source, break the transmission pathways, and protecting the successful group of persons. And cutting down the source is really, I uh, will argue, that the most effective way to do this. So, all right, and that's why there are so many um, uh, studies about masks. Uh, and and uh, oh, I also want to point out that I think for this audience, it's not difficult to understand that a mask really has two-way traffic. Now, for most people are thinking about a mask is to protecting, is to protect yourself. But for those of you who have had any clean room experience, you will know that we go into a semiconductor fab, we need to suit up but there's really nothing inside that's gonna, gonna jump on you and bite you. We sued up because we wanna protect ourselves from contaminating the devices, right? In fact, I have heard that in modern farms where people raise uh, pigs and, and cows, you actually now have to suit up in, in a clean room suit to get in there because we don't wanna bring viruses and bacteria to those animals. Okay, all right, so yes, a mask has two dual purpose, uh, but in, in a pandemic, I think it's much more important that people understand that a mask is really to protect the environment from you, okay? So we were thinking about um, what can we do to this. So there are a lot of mask related researches. Now, um, I have to admit that this is also an intellectual progress for me as well. When I started to think about this problem in um, uh, early March, uh, end, of, uh, end of February, at that time, actually both my group and myself, we thought that, you know, the mask shortage is, is only going to be temporary. 
uh, give it a week or two weeks, everything will back to normal. Okay, the supply chain will be restored. But I guess I think we were incredibly naive at the time. So that's why. Uh, but on the other hand, this actually creates a lot of ways that um, uh, you know engineers and physical scientists can help because you you can address any aspect of the mask problem. So we have heard about re, uh, re-sanitizing N95 masks or re-sanitizing uh, ordinary masks. We also have seen now there's a boom in DIY masks, right? Uh, fashion masks. So I, I'm glad to see all these activities because at least you know it helps to increase the awareness of people about this problem. Now people now have more and more people accept that wearing a mask is not about protecting yourself. You can be fearless, you, you can you can be fearless and doesn't need that to protect, protect yourself, but you must be considerate enough to protect others from you, okay? Again, because there's this uh, pre-symptomatic or asymptom, uh, asymptomatic carrier issue. Okay, so we were actually thinking about that um, by talking to the doctors back then, we learned that um, the current masks, uh, for example, the N95 masks that Peter invented, actually all of the doctors we spoke to, they were like, wow, that's pretty good already. I don't really see why you need to fundamentally change that. Um, okay, and in fact, you know, what they say is that the, the more worrying uh, aspect of N95 masks is that improper training. So you probably see people getting uh, wearing N95 masks but getting infected more because of lack of training and improper use, uh, much more of that than actually because N95 cannot stop the virus particles, okay? So then we had a different approach. We were thinking about ahead, uh, maybe let's, how do we prepare for the next one? So at that time, our research design was rooted in how do we prepare the next one? We thought, we were also naively thinking that this thing is gonna be miraculously go over in the summer. Um, so we started to think about what do we do next? So um, by extensive uh, literature search in both physical sciences, engineering and medical field, and we realized that there's actually, uh, this seemed to be a new idea that hasn't really been explored. So uh, to the best of our knowledge. So our thought is that, you know, instead of, uh, well, a mask is meant to block, right? Stop the droplets. But we were thinking that instead of that, because if you want to stop all the droplets, you're going to have to use very high end uh, grade of, uh, very high grade of masks, okay? But what about like ordinary face covering and just a, a cheap medical mask? Uh, they are not going to stop all the droplets. Some droplets are going to be released no matter what. Um, but we were thinking that uh, going back to early on to the intuitive picture that the virus particles need to stay intact throughout the entire process. But there are tons of ways that you can introduce a physical or chemical mechanism to mess up the structure. And once the structure is, is altered, okay, it's malfunctioned, then they should be inactivated. So we were thinking that let's, maybe we can come up with a chemical way to do this. So this is a very rudimentary schematic drawing to show the idea. So imagine I have a respiratory uh, droplet uh, with vir virus particles in it. These are the red particles of viruses. Now, if we force them to pass through a chemical screening layer, a chemical modifier layer, and then the chemical modifier layer is loaded with antiviral ke uh, chemicals, antiviral compounds, and then hopefully some of these will dissolve in these droplets. So as the droplets are released uh, during exhalation, so we, and we may not block all the droplets, but we contaminate them as many as possible so that when they dry up, Okay, uh, remember dry, when, the, uh, when water droplet dries, there is a third power relating the diameter and the volume. So whatever antiviral chemicals you dope these droplets is gonna get concentrated by third power, okay, very rapidly. So we realized that this might be a way that you can introduce very little antiviral chemicals, but then they can actually drastically help to deactivate the virus. So um, we wrote up uh, this idea together with a bunch of other ideas. At that time, I think we first um, approached uh, the National Science Foundation somewhere about uh, early to mid-March. And I recall at that time that I was writing to the Division of Materials Research. I said that, hey, this looks uh, completely out of blue. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether this is going to be relevant, but I think this is an important subject and maybe uh, here's an idea and maybe NSF should release a, uh, a rapid 
mechanism to call for proposals from physical science engineering. And then the DMR folks were very um, accepting to this idea. They were very excited. They were like, this is a great idea. We should do this. And then uh, coincidentally, very rapidly, uh, and that's actually released a rapid call. So I was like, wow, somebody over there was thinking about the same thing. So I felt pretty uh, good about that. But nevertheless, it still took about four trials because my, my white paper was rejected four times before eventually funded. But anyway, so with that, uh, we received the funding, I think, in, uh, uh, in mid-March. Uh, uh, that's actually, uh, no, we received the notice in mid-March. And but by the time we received the notice, we realized that, OK, uh, we're not going to just work for the next one because the current one is actually coming. So that's right before campus shut down in Northwestern, right before the uh, uh, state of Illinois Institute this stay home order. So we only had about like a two or three days to just start to collect chemicals and collect supplies because we know once the campus shut down, we can have a lot of problem in getting these things. So, but fortunately we were able to at least get a few days heads up to collect and order some things. And here's the design, uh, the rudimentary design. So we, we're gonna use a, uh, this is what we described, um, indicated in the proposal that we're gonna use like some kind of uh, uh, pneumatically generated um, droplets. So in this case, for example, a pump, controlled pump to simulate coughing and sneezing. So in this case, they will release fluid droplets uh, with the size distribution and density and also velocity. Okay, uh, the, the three parameters, size distribution, dense, uh, the, the uh, let's say uh, number density in a given volume, as well as the uh, velocity. The, the three parameters collectively fitting the range of what people observed and measured, studied for coughing and sneezing. So we know it's a reasonable uh, simulated system. Now the model fluid, fortunately you can buy that. Uh, the, you can, there are uh, various types of model saliva and respiratory fluids you can buy. So after, uh, uh, after waiting for quite a while, we eventually get it. So we start to think about that we need a chemical modulation layer. And the key here is that we don't want to just coat it on mask for a few different reasons. I mean, one reason is that number one, I think whatever we do should not disrupt mask manufacturing because these mask manufacturers, they're already stre uh, stressed out, right? The whole world is in short of masks. If, my, if any new technology would require them to stop, and, and then re-implement, I mean, redesign the manufacturing. I, I felt that's very inappropriate at that time. So- You got so three we, more minutes. Uh, oh, okay. So, okay, well, I'll, I'll speed up. So we, we were thinking about um, uh, just making this as an add-on layer. So as an add-on layer, this criteria is that the, air, the pressure drop must be as little as possible. So pressure drop basically indicates how difficult it is to breathe through them. You can use an extremely dense fabric, fabric that will stop all the particles and droplets, but then you can't breathe. So we also need a chemical uh, uh, sort of colorimetric detector layer so we know that whether the droplets are actually modified or not. Okay, so if you think about the composition of what we inhale and exhale, there's actually a few key differences. When we exhale, we're pushing warm and wet air together with droplets outside. But when we inhale, we have cold and dry air. So the speed can vary. So we, when we design this modifying material, we wanna remind people that this, in this aspect, you have to be really be very mindful about the risk of inhaling what you put on a mask, okay? Because if you put something that's not uh, super strongly anchored, that or, or that is fundamentally can be uh, loosened, for example, during rubbing or touching, then you are creating a risk of inhaling whatever you put on the mask. So after, after this consideration, we decided that we're gonna use small molecular modifiers, such as mineral acid, or for example, copper cations that I mentioned by a few speakers already. And for model system, we use conducting polymer polyaniline, uh, which can grow very well on textiles. And we grow that on it. And here's the results. So this is a polyaniline coated gauss fabric. This is just a common medical gauss. And uh, you can grow polyaniline on it. It turned green because it, containing, it contains acid. We also use polyaniline in undoped state, which is a beautiful blue color here. And when we have droplets landing 
on the layer, uh, reflectance mode, you're going to see a lot of droplets because this is a model fluid. So there are going to be a lot of other components like the protein particles and enzymes and polymers, etc. But when you turn on the transmission mode, you will see clearly a color difference. So only those droplets that are acidic enough will start to show up as a green dots. Okay, so because they, when they pass through the screening layer, they are going to carry some acid and land it on the target. So the initial, oh, so these are the two students, uh, a student and a postdoc actually working on this. So they actually volunteered to become uh, essential researchers. So they have not rested for like even a day throughout this pandemic. They started working on this day and night, uh, actually uh, in the first week of the uh, a shutdown area and they, they continue to work on that. And they recently are joined by a self-funded MS student to help them to do data analysis. To make a very long story short, and this is the conclusion, um, this is a uh, very complicated diagram, but I would try to explain the, the conclusions. So basically the starting, the pH value of the starting droplets is about six. After they pass through the acid modified, uh, the acid screen, then when it lands on the, the, the substrate, we set the threshold so that only the droplets with a pH of about two to one, 2.5 to one are counted as modified. By the way, this is like a four, like a four, about four orders of magnitude increase in acid concentration, okay? So based on this criteria, we know that with the medical gals, which by the way, give me one second. So <laughs> I have a piece of materials right here, you guys, uh, sorry for the background, but this is the, okay, a piece of medical gauss. It's very loose. If you put it on your nose, there's like a no resistance at all. So we measure zero pressure drop. And even with that, you can modify 14% of the droplets by number, but if you not, if you convert it to volume, which is over half of the volume of the respiratory droplets are modified. Now, if you use other lint-free wipes, such as, for example, clean wipe, which has higher density, then you can, uh, this actually give you, gives you a, a low pressure drop comparable to the middle layer of disposable masks. But immediately you can modify a lot more, like about half of the droplets by number and about 87% by volume. So this has a significant modification effect. Okay, so another a, a quick idea, I will, I will not talk about detail, is that uh, to mitigate formity infections. To do this, then it will be ideal to generate uh, self-sanitizing surfaces. And in one particular case is a self-sanitizing um, a stainless steel surface because again, uh, there were earlier studies from SARS days to show that these viruses seem to be very stable on stainless steel surface for days or even over a week. So we realize here that, I think Peter was asking a question, why do they have different uh, viabilities? Why can they survive a different amount of time on different surfaces? We realize that there's one thing that people don't seem to uh, always talked about and which I think is very problematic. So when, when we study viruses in lab, it's in a relatively clean environment. When we put nanoparticles in solvent, right? We don't want to put a lot of other junks. But when these viruses are released in a, a respiratory droplet, um, it's actually surrounded by tons of other junks. So there are proteins and debris. There are actually even bacterial colony pieces. There are also liposome polymers, liposome molecules and, and, and small molecular polymers. So in the end, if you look at what's dry, what's dried up, the uh, volume or, or the weight fraction of viruses might even be negligible. It's actually a, a very minor component in what you are dealing with. So in, in this case, when you are designing any antiviral surfaces, any sanitizing mechanisms, you have to have this picture, physical picture in mind. For example, if your sanitizing mechanism is based on contact, then chances are that the great majority of the virus in a final dried particle is actually not even in contact with your surface. So it's not going to work. Okay. So we are thinking about doing, uh, having like a spray on uh, a chemically reactive layer that can convert stainless steel surface with a uh, uh, amorphous oxide layer, sort of like a creating the aluminum oxide version of uh, stainless steel. You know, aluminum is very reactive, but because of the self-passivating layer of aluminum oxide, you can actually use uh, aluminum for cooking. But for stainless steel, it doesn't have that layer yet. Uh, we, well, it has a native layer, but we want to give it another layer like that, a self-passivating layer. But this layer now is also a control release layer for different metal ions. So we just 
discovered some preliminary results about uh, controlled copper release, which seem to work really well. So uh, we're hoping this will continue later on. So this part is actually now a four person effort. Uh, we had a very, very tiny uh, support from Office of Naval Research, which is basically based on my current grant. Uh, they want us to repurpose it, so put aside what we're doing on graphing, go do this thing because it seemed to be more urgent. So I'm happy that um, all of them are very, um, again, uh, volunteer to work on this throughout the pandemic. So again, there are other ideas in this paper. I encourage you to take a quick look at it. And in fact, uh, there is now a, uh, uh, a pandemic materials task force, which is on its way to become an NGO. Uh, they have summarized some of the ideas in this poster. Uh, again, uh, if you're interested, take a quick Google, you will be able to find a website. And the authors of this paper, I just wanted to show you, this is the student I really want to highlight. Uh, she showed re remarkable cu uh, courage during this process because she's willing to put aside her own research and also take the, 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 uh, the academic risk as well as personal risk to come to lab to work every day. And we have a bunch of other ex uh, extraordinary female uh, co-authors. Uh, for example, Dr. Lee here is a director of, uh, uh, in charge of testing in the Shanghai hospital. This was my former group member. She was fearlessly looking for all these people for me. And she's also transforming her research to work on uh, advanced PPEs for health workers. And this is the director of public health uh, in Shanghai Jiao Tong University. She gave a public uh, education campaign that collectively have over 100 million views about COVID-19, what this is, what you should do, why you should wear masks. And Dr. Wan is the uh, director of the uh, ICU in a hospital in Shanghai. She's super, super busy, but we were able to catch her when she was returning from Wuhan in a self-quarantine 14 days, we were able to catch her during that 14 days. That's how she can give us lots of ideas. Uh, this doctor, uh, Dr. Zen was the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, expert team lead in, in a Wuhan hospital. And uh, again, she's also very busy. She often talked to me at about 2 a.m. in her time and telling us about the ideas and, and the needs in, for healthcare workers. So we made up this poster just to show, to encourage that, you know, we, can, it, we, we should really break boundaries and work together to create solutions, right? And the virus is certainly spread uh, very well, and, but ideas can spread as well. So let's drop all the barriers and, and think about what we can do by working together. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to questions now or later. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So. Uh... I'm not sure if there's a question. I, I can allow one question. Okay. Uh, uh, there's one. Uh, can pani cause toxicity? I mean, that's... Oh, what about the toxicity test? Is yeah. that the idea? Okay. Uh, we haven't been able to do any of those yet. It turns, those turn out to be a lot more complicated than we originally thought, but... So this is what we can still do. In our design, we're not based our design on any specific interaction to COVID-19. So for example, for copper, this is a known broadband spectrum, a broadband, a broad spectrum antiviral agent and antibacterial agent as well, because it can almost disrupt the virus structure at all levels, right from the envelope, the, the, uh, the, the protein shell, and also the RNA and DNA. So it is well known and there are, as we, as actually, as we were doing our work, there are other studies coming out to show that, yeah, copper indeed can also work for COVID-19. So, I mean, because these viruses have certain generic uh, structures, in terms of biological application, they are case by case, very specific. But in terms of, if you look at the physical structure and function, I mean, they share common structures and, and, and properties. So something like copper, silver, and extreme pH and uh, extreme desiccation, these are known to be able to disrupt the structures. So we base all of our design on that. And we've been very uh, aggressive in terms of the load. Okay, we're not gonna release like a PPT level of copper. We, we are gonna overdose that. If we can overdose that and without causing negative consequences, then I think this has a promising way to go. Thank you. So I think we have to move on. So uh, thank you very much. So if you have questions, just please, uh, uh, you can use the chat and, and, and the speakers can reply to those.